Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast is proudly sponsored by New Vision. My team, Kanda, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. power, power. I love Hi and welcome to the Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast, a weekly show about the Port Adelaide Footy Club. I'm your host, Macca19, and joining me as always as co-host, we've got Fishing Rick. How are you, buddy? Very, very happy, Macca. Very happy. What about you? Fantastic, buddy. What a bloody oh, great, great work. Oh, fantastic, wasn't it? That's it. And back on the podcast is the fantastic Foot Falcon. I have returned. Here yeah. Is. The big we, jo- we finally meet. It's the, uh, it's the big moderator podcast, so if nobody likes it, we infract them out of existence. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Fire up, lads. What a great weekend it was for Port Adelaide. Oh, sensational. Yeah. If, you, if you're not satisfied this weekend, you're going to be very hard-pressed to ever be satisfied. That's it. Yeah. Well, look, let's get, to, let's get straight into it. Love and hate. One thing we loved, one thing we hated this week about the Port Adelaide Footy Club. Ford, mate, I might start with you. Okay. Um, mine's a, a very recent one. I was just looking at the uh, website today and saw the new Indigenous Guernsey, and I really loved it. thought it looks great. Really clear, simple design. Um, really represents the, the culture and Port Adelaide's representation of, of their standing the Aboriginal community and taking on board the, the concept of the round. It's really great and sort of bring that into line with the Aboriginal Power Cup that was just played this weekend and Port Adelaide's you know, fantastic community work that really differentiates it from other clubs, I believe. And while we, we talk about we exist to win premierships, I think the Port Adelaide's, um, I guess, intuition or acceptance of getting into the community, giving the community something to support and supporting the community is a really important stake in the ground in helping develop that premiership winning culture by really engaging with the supporters and the people who could become supporters. So um, fantastic stuff. Love the Guernsey. Love that um, a player's family was involved in its development and think it looks terrific. It does. It's fantastic. And what about your hate? Um, probably, I was thinking inconsistency in umpiring in the uh, in the AFL this round, and Ooh. maybe <laughs> possibly <laughs> over the season. I I hate to bag umpires, and I'm not really talking about you know just bad decisions in general or pushing a back that should be holding the ball, things like that. It's those decisions that sort of come out of the blue, and there was some discussion of it on the boards on the weekend. Um, I think the the West off handball that was called a throw uh, was the one that sort of got my my ire up a bit because I think the way that the game is being umpired now where we're getting basically rugby scrums in the game and players are just dropping the ball, they're handing it over to teammates, they're tunnelling it between their legs, say, you know, describe it how you will. There's there's virtually an incorrect disposal going on every five seconds and then to pluck one out of nowhere that was really no different to the Chad Wingard handball over the back of his head that Robbie Gray just picked up immaculately off the ground and snapped for a goal it was it was just absurd. And and even um, watching the game yesterday, Carlton were playing someone, and um, a Carlton player went over the mark, and he, like a nanosecond, the umpire game blew the whistle, paid fifty. And I'm watching our game, and and time and guys are over the mark, they dawdle back to the mark. Someone walks across the mark. The umpires are just saying, "Oh yeah, no, that's okay." And then suddenly there's a guy. I think, what, 70 metres out from goal, gets given a 50. It's basically a gift goal. It changes the momentum of the game. I mean, even the Westhoff one, for me, was a bit of a momentum shift that we were getting pinned into that defensive 50 for a, a minute or two there. And then just as we were breaking free, we got forced back in there again. And I think that really helped them with that four-goal run they had um, that, that cut our five-goal lead back to one by three-quarter time. I'm not saying that, it's all due to umpiring, but I think they really do contribute to momentum shifts by plucking a decision out that no one expects, and, oh, and not just our game. It's happening, you know, in other games as well. Yeah, rant of the year, Ford Fairlane. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Told me to fire up. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough too. Rick, what's your love and hate, mate? Uh, well, I I just wanted to say I love the crowd. Um, even though the, the march was a bit annoying because I got stung 
trying to park at the festival theatre car park. So I got I got hit by the march on uh, North Terrace by the casino. I had to wait ten minutes there. They and jumped then I turned, on it. No, nah, no, nah, it wasn't that close, fortunately. But the right police were there, and then uh, had to go under the casino car park. And then, of course, I hit the crowd again, going and <laughs> backlogged over the uh, bridge. And I was thinking to myself, that was uh, not a great tactical error. But I mean, how passionate are our supporters? Um, you know, I don't don't know where they were a couple of years ago, but you know, everyone's come out in force now, and it's fantastic. I mean, the atmosphere of the games, filling the game, and, and getting fifty two grand there, and and really. Um, you know, it's not even about beating the Crows. It's just filling the uh, it's filling the stadium for our players and our supporters, and and making the game day experience um, a great experience for people to go to, and hopefully just just keeps um, a self propelling um, forward motion for us as a footy club and as a supporter group. Fifty two thousand two hundred and thirty three. magnificent. Let's see. What about your hate? Oh uh, look, I'm Tango is still neglected it. On the York Peninsula, I can't pull her out. I've got to save her next week. My house will be trashed. But um, Hamish Hartlett getting a game for that is just outrageous. I said outrageous last week to poor Big Al, and I'm going to say outrageous again. I mean, there was absolutely nothing in that. And what's even more outrageous is his poor record at the tribunal. What's he actually done? I can't. What do you? He had an accidental head clash and got rubbed out for three games. And particularly uh, Shepherd. Pardon. Uh, Apparently a particularly brutal shepherd. Oh, rubbish. I know, like, I know you know what's rubbish. I know you're being facetious, but... Um, like Kane Corns breathing on Sam Mitchell and getting three oh, games. Funny yeah, how it's, it's always a... Hawthorne, this. You know, yeah. they, they always go on about unsociable football and, you know, how they're the toughest, meanest footy team in the league. But, God, if you even breathe near one of their players, they whinge and moan like something chronic. And once again, just like in the Harlet and Rioli case a couple of years ago... The uh, the Hawthorne Club doctors have, uh, have has thrown Hartlett directly under the bus with this one. No, no sympathy from me, Macca. I'm just it just agitates me, and it's it goes, and There's more more inconsistency uh, in the AFL, and I mean to think that. And I didn't want Gary Ablett getting rubbed out, but I mean for Gary Ablett to walk free, and then that little toilet love tap is just beyond a joke and it, it yeah, just makes the AFL a farce in my opinion and that's Rick's outrageous call for the week. That's it. Love it. Now my love this week, it's uh, it's feeling like that we're actually part of the AFL again and that might sound a little bit controversial to some but um, you know from 2008 to 2012 it, it kind of almost felt like we reverted back to being an SANFL club. Um, you know terrible crowds, seat covers, you know, no pre-game entertainment, um, no confidence from the supporters, no confidence in the uh, in the coaching or the playing group. You know, we took some really bad steps backwards. But, you know, last year we took some really big steps forward. Um, mm. And this year it finally feels like we're part of the AFL again. I'm not even talking about the on-field stuff. I'm talking about um, just, you know, once again I sat there in absolute disbelief at how incredible this new stadium is, Adelaide Oval, from the entertainment on the outside of the ground, how easy it is to get in, how absolutely fantastic it looks on the inside, especially at night time. Um, you know, the huge pre-game entertainment that we had, the massive amount of people there. Um, you know, this is what the AFL should really be in this state, and we're finally doing it. I mean, who would have thought in 2012 when we were getting thirteen or 14,000 people to games that, you know, just 15 home games later, we'd actually break the South Australian AFL home ground record. You know, that's just unbelievable. I think I, I read today, I'm, I'm not sure if this is right, you may correct me on this, but in our the four home games so far this year, we've exceeded our entire home and away crowd aggregate for last year at Football Park. Mm. I mean, if, if that's right, that is just incredible. And you're right, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I think what what was happening to us before was we were becoming irrelevant in the AFL. It was almost... For, from from what your your comment, the way I read it was, or the way I've, I've felt about that was, we were just being ignored. If anything, we we just didn't count. We you were, know? Oh, we, we were well, absolutely like irrelevant. Something. So we were well. irrelevant. And you are correct. Uh, we've now overtaken 2012's aggregate attendance in just five home games this year, yeah. which is uh, which is pretty stunning. 
Um, yeah. it's, it's it is amazing, and and I'd like to say too, like you mentioned that pre-game show, and that that was just um, that was just brilliant. I know there's there's been a bit of talk because they messed around with the the sort of the musical intros a bit there to do the fireworks and the the big flame things, and but the whole lighting um, atmosphere they created with the the LED signage and the scoreboards and the countdown, and I think uh, whoever was responsible for that deserves you know a big pat on the back if that's the Port Multimedia team. That was just brilliantly done. Yeah. Um, really set the stage beautifully for for them coming out and and entering the arena and really building up the crowd and and firing them up for what was already going to be a huge game. That's right. Uh, special mention to Eddie Dingle. Uh, another great effort at the game. He, a fantastic, fantastic effort. He <laughs> annoyed friend and foe alike, inflicted bruises on everyone, and uh, brought his own particular ba- brand of merry mayhem to all who were around him. That's right. <laughs> and my hate for this week is the unfortunate, seemingly long-term injuries to Campbell Heath and Brent Renouf. Um it's, it's just very unfortunate. That's four um, knee injuries this year um, that we've had. Um, I know Campbell Heath's had a knee reconstruction before, so it's, it's particularly unfortunate for him. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Brent Renouf, um, it just leaves our ruck um, contingent on a knife's edge, really. We've got the power to win, power to roll. All right, well, let's, uh, let's go on to the AFL review. Um, Port Adelaide played Hawthorne at, uh, at Adelaide Oval on Saturday night in front of a, a record crowd of 52,200 people. It was a 14-point victory for Port Adelaide, 15 goals 10 to 13 goals 8. Uh, Gus Monfries was the leading goal kicker with uh, four goals. Chatty Wingard kicked another three, um, and Hammer and Robbie Gray kicked two each. Rick, uh, what were your thoughts on the game, mate? Oh, look, it was a, a fantastic, intense game and uh, all the media is, uh, has been talking about how fast it was and, and let's let's give credit to, uh, to Hawthorne as well. I mean, with their injuries, which was all spoken about and, you know, and you mentioned their plug-and-play style and they did, they plug-and-played and, and uh, I, know, I noticed you commented, back and you didn't think the, the players out in would have been, made a massive difference and I, I sort of agree with you because they, they were very serviceable and, and the thing I noticed from Hawthorne defensively which would have been great for the Port Adelaide team as a whole was uh, how fast Hawthorne got into their defensive positioning you know I mean we were kick we kicked a couple of points and when we kicked the point they were out of defensive structure and then I, and I looked up or from a quick conversation and Brody was ready to kick in and bang they were right into their defensive structure and, and that was a great test for our guys to work through it but I mean Boys, what about that first 15, 20 minutes of the game? Our, our, our intensity and pressure at the body and the ball was just second to none around the contest, and we just completely dominated. You know, we were winning the freeze because we were first ones of the ball, getting our hands on it. Our movement was just fantastic, and, and Hawthorne didn't have an answer. Oh, that first 20 minutes just really set the tone, and, and, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, was the match-winning lead in those first 20 minutes. We haven't had to talk about a slow start for months. It's fantastic. No, no, they've, they've really they just burst out of the blocks there, and the the ball movement was so quick and and so sure, and uh, and the conversion was you know pretty good. I mean, we really didn't get anything from the tall forwards on on the night, and it was more Wingard, Monfries, I think, kicking seven between them that that did a fair bit of damage. I think uh, Schultze was in position probably to take four or five marks in goal scoring range they just all went through his hands it was it was uh, unusual he will usually at least take a couple of them I think yeah. Hoff, Hoff um, clunked a couple of decent marks and I think he, he gave him something to think about and he's almost when he drops into the back line it's almost like having that in the basketball parlance having that seven footer in the key way that makes you change up your shot and it's very difficult for, for teams to really go direct to that hot spot 30 metres out from goal because they know Westhoff's there. Um, and, and also, I've, I've got to mention, and I, I, this was almost almost made it into one of my loves of the week, was that, that clash between Jurea and Mitchell in the second quarter where um, Mitchell picked the ball up, just took off and ran straight into Jurea. They basically ran into each other. It was almost like a, a bit of a shirt front, I guess, but no no high contact. And poor old Kane, Mitchell 
bounced off like a tennis ball and hit the deck. And he, he said he got up and he was he seemed okay, so no one was hurt. And it was just this, just an amazing physical clash of two guys just going full tilt at each other, and uh, it was uh, it was incredible to to see. Yeah, I mean, I found the game had a similar feel to Hawthorne against Sydney uh, a few weeks ago, and to me, I think. We almost had Hawthorne beat before the game started because they seemed to be more focused um, on uh, the defensive aspects more so than their offensive as- aspects of the game plan, uh, which meant that, that they're always trying to chase the game instead of trying to uh, uh, to win the game. Um, but I, uh, the thing with the tall forwards that really I was a bit disappointed with both Shield and Westhoff from an offensive. Uh, perspective, not defensively. Um, I just found they just seem to me, especially Schultz. I thought he seemed to be a little bit showboaty, like just trying to take the big specky. There wasn't really much of that hard workman like leading, uh, repeat leading, trying to get the leads and spot up target. It was more just sort of plonk, let's plonk it to him and let me take the big mark over the over the back of the pack. That was the vibe that I got. And I mean, look, I'm being very critical on Jay here because he set he sets high, very high standards over the last couple of years, and he's turned into a great forward. But that's the vibe that I got out of the game uh, from our tall forwards. Yeah, I was a little bit disappointed with Schultz's game, more from the fact that I reckon he had the perfect sit about five or six times and just grasped the ball every single yeah, time. Yeah. Just just couldn't take the grab. And you're right, there wasn't really a lot of leading with Schultz um, on the weekend. I don't think there was probably the opportunity either. Um, you know, he was playing sort of further out from the forward 50 and having to double back Um when we sort of were running the ball forward, and that's how he got in behind those uh, in those sort of positions to get the sit. Um, it's just unfortunate that he uh, that he couldn't take those grabs because he could have really ended up with four or five goals if yeah. he started taking those grabs. And, um, and the kicks over the top were, were pretty good to him. I mean, they, they, they yeah, they were. Yeah. And, but but as Rick said, it was a couple, of, at least a couple of times, maybe more. He. He did seem to try to go for the fly rather than just hold his ground, not so yep. much nudge the guy out, but just hold his ground and then just fall back and take the grab. I mean, yeah. the, the he could have probably worked himself in front as well, um, maybe yeah. on a couple of occasions. But but he wasn't um, going to up that one he chased down and ran into the goal square with. Like, no, no. <laughs> the dinosaur <laughs> lumbering through the Labria tar pits <laughs> analogy. He was he was having that one. He, no one's Chad Wingo can wave his arms all he liked. That ball wasn't going anywhere out, but off of. Jay's boot. You mentioned the first quarter and how intense it was. Matty Lobie's first quarter, is that just about the best quarter of footy he's played at AFL level? Certainly in terms of... I think in terms of his ruck work and his second efforts, I mean, it's it's a bit like it's a bit like watching Ollie Wines now, isn't it? You sort of... It's a standard he's set and you sort of go, oh, yeah, he's, he's met that standard, so he's, he was OK. And then when you go back and look at it again, you realise just how just almost phenomenal that work rate actually is and the, the standard you're setting. I think that you said that about Ollie's game, Mac, that you went back and when you watched it again, you had him bumped him up to a 9 out of 10. Yep. And and I had a similar thing with, say, Kane Mitchell, where I thought at three-quarter time I'd have subbed him off. I thought he was terrible. Then I watched it again. I thought the first half, um, he was really it's in there and working good. hard yeah. and not a ton of possessions, but I don't expect that of him. I think part of his role is that he's so fit and so quick now that if he can just get to contest after contest and create the pressure that Ken wants around the ground, uh, he's as much fulfilling his role as he needs to getting the ball and kicking it. And, and even Matthew White, I thought, was, was way more influential watching the replay than I thought he was at the ground. I thought he got a lot more of it than I thought he had, say, at half time. Yep. And so with someone like Lobie, again, yes, you're right, he's a, a huge effort, but almost setting himself a benchmark there that that's what he's going to do every week. I think you said in your review of him, though, just if he took a couple more grabs around the ground. Yeah, he's uh, just not, it, not a marking it, target coming out of the mm. uh, defensive 50, and he probably needs to be. It's something that was in his game last year, but he seems yeah. to have lost it a little bit, and he hasn't really regained that at all. At any stage he's such this a year. big man now. I mean, he's, he's he is. He should be clunking more marks. He's, he I mean, just... he's only averaging 1.8 marks a game this year, yeah, it's, and it's, he hasn't uh... taken over three marks a game at all this year. So yeah. it's probably that's definitely a part of his game that he absolutely needs to work on. Yeah, that's where Jackson Trengoves uh, can offer us a little bit with that mobile positioning because I mean he's not afraid to take a mark, and he almost pulled off a fantastic specky there in. Uh, I think in the last quarter, it was yep. uh, 
Yeah, he went, went for a massive fly, and so he's got that influence. But, I mean, if you're talking about marks, and it's been commented on by quite a few people now, is uh, Jack Homps and his courage uh, when it comes to marking and running back with the flight of the ball. Uh, and there was a Glen Archer comparison there, which I'm sure he would uh, take gleefully, but uh, he's a very courageous and just evolving every game, Jack Homps. Bit of, bit, of that Glen Archer, bit of that Glen Archer mongrel in Loby wouldn't go astray. I, I remember Glen Archer. <laughs> sorry, I just just to divert here for a moment. But I remember, um, remember that that really tall beanpole ruckman that played for North Melbourne. Um, I, I've forgotten Spider his name. Burton. Spider Burton. Spider Burton, and uh, I think they were he and Glen Archer went down to Tasmania. I think it was to do a bit of a, a clinic down there. I think it was pre the Hawthorne days there, and. And they were talking to Glenn Archer about it afterwards, and he was saying how, like, everybody, he said, everybody would go up to, to Spider and go, oh, what's the weather like up there, mate? Jeez, you're tall. And he said, I was getting angry and angry. I was just, I was just getting sick of it, you know. And you used to imagine Glenn Archer <laughs> belting someone because they were, the, they were the 20th guy to say, you know, what's the weather like up there, mate? You know, he, was just, <laughs> he was just that sort of really intense guy, and a, a bit of that into, into a... Um, into a a Lobie or even, you know, Hompshire is, is he's a really courageous player, though. He's not, yes. probably doesn't need to be that angry as Glenn Archer. But, yeah, it's a, a fair comparison in terms of courage and, and willingness to take a hit. I thought that was possibly the best game I've seen him play. And a, a couple of, he's so strong overhead, like he gets back into that position. He's got a, not quite a wing guard-esque vertical leap, but he's got a pretty decent one. For, yeah. for a big guy who's now, he'd, he'd go 94, 95 kilos, I reckon, and he's yep. 192, 3 centimetres. And really clean one grab player, and his disposal's pretty good. Um, I don't think he's, uh, he definitely doesn't have that white line fever that Glenn Archer has, no. but um, he's almost like the perfect uh, morphing of Brent Montgomery and uh, Chad Corns. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a good Maybe call. not as spectacular as Chad, but, but certainly as reliable a mark. I thought the team, or I thought the defensive unit stood up uh, for the game, but I also thought um, as a team defensively we were fantastic, but I also thought we were almost a little bit too respectful to Hawthorne in a way because on a lot of occasions we seemed to rush ourselves or just panic ourselves when we actually had a bit more time. So I think as a playing group they were expecting... Um, that Hawthorne pressure a fraction of a second earlier than what they were. And, um, you know, so we could have probably been a little bit more composed with our execution. And I think it was a great game that the players will take a lot out of um, just from that experience going, well, hang on, maybe we should have backed ourselves in a little bit more because we did have a bit more time. We were in the right yeah. positions, but there was, there was quite a few times, you, you know, Robbie Gray dropped a, a pretty easy mark and you could see it was quite clear from my angle on the wing that he, he dropped it expecting the pressure to come and it didn't come and we had the same with a few handballs and uh, I think there will be a good experience to take away. There was three or four uh, moments where we had players charging inside 50, you know, 30 or 40 metres on their own and we muffed the disposal uh, to a player that could have got it to them. Uh, that happened, uh, definitely happened in the first quarter, happened a few times in the third quarter Um you talk about that Robbie Gray mark. There was also the time where Monfries dropped the mark and then fluffed the handball when he was on the ground. Yeah. We had two yeah, players was... 30 metres on their own, basically in the goal square. And that was almost the turning point in the game because Hawthorne kicked four goals straight away after that. I was thinking, God, if only we had got that goal. Um, I actually thought our running game was really, really good. I thought um, when we chose to take risks with our uh, sort of fast movement, it came off really, really well. The thing that I was really disappointed with was um, I thought our kicking coming out of the defensive 50 was horrible for much of the game. Um, and it was almost like we were trying deliberately to go through the corridor, even if the options weren't really there. There was a number of times where we chose kicks where you just think, why on earth would you go there when there's three or four opponents closing down on someone like Kane Mitchell, who's you know three foot eight? Um, and that happened three or four times as well. I think sometimes mm. they're a bit too brave. They, yeah. they take yeah. Kenny's mantra a bit far. Um, I think um, I think Kane Mitchell, I think, did that one. Was it that the turnover where he kicked the ball straight to someone? Yeah. He had 50 yeah. metres in the clear yeah. on the wing and he went for the corridor. And it was almost a, a, a Tommy Logan moment, you know. The, yeah. The, that the that happened five or six victory. times where we went for, we specifically went for 
a it contested option. option in the corridor as opposed to going for someone on the uh, on the flanks who was by themselves. But in that instant, it would have been the more attacking play to go to that guy on the wing because he was just in an open paddock. Yeah, yeah. I think that I saw a comment, a quote today, and one I read an article about the game, and and they said how Port Adelaide want to own the centre corridor, and we're getting really good at it. And I think we just sometimes we just take that option because we're trying to assert ourselves as the centre corridor kings. Yeah, and it's uh, very Geelong. Geelong, Geelong do it, and they'll and. Remember, we're, we're into our, you know, one and a half years under Ken Hinckley, you know, a couple of pre-seasons under Burgess and, and McEwen. And I always like to mention McEwen because I think strength-wise, um, we look completely different to what we looked like when Burgess was here the first time. I think we've, I think Kenny's really made the point. I think he really took something out of that Frio game in round 22 yep. and said, we have to be physically stronger. We have to be able to match it with teams like Frio and Geelong and Hawthorne and We've beaten all three of them now, and we've matched them all physically. It's yep. it's been great. I think it's been partly. I think sometimes our issue is I don't think we they sometimes they don't believe that it's going as well as it can. I think that comes back to your point, Rick, where the they'll either fluff marks or they'll they'll make a mistake that don't you just wouldn't expect them to make. And and I even go back to round one against Melbourne last year, where we were we had Melbourne on toast, and we were. Chopping Melbourne, I think they actually believed how much better they were than Melbourne after being told for years that Melbourne were probably better than us. And it took them until about the third quarter to realise, we, we can really win this. And the, and the killer instinct kicked in. And I think against Hawthorne, it probably did kick in during that third quarter. And then there was just that, well, the fluffed handball that would have that would have put us further in front, the, the West off free kick. And then they just went back into their shell a bit and got caught up on the back foot. But I think as that confidence grows and, and they really do start to own the centre corridor as such and and keep playing that way, they will just get better and better because, again, they come back to being a very young side. And as they keep executing, keep playing that style of game, they get fitter, which is a scary thought, mm. and stronger and bigger. And I I've, I've sort of have oh, 99% sure that Ken... Kenny Hinckley's going to try and get a gorilla forward into the club, whether he develops that player as Harvey or as possibly a, a Mason Shaw, whether he's he's not as physically as big as he looked like he would be coming through as an under-18. But just someone up there that you can just kick it long to, and, and I've heard this said, probably the one thing about us come finals time, that we don't have that sort of guy that, as a default option, you can just go long to in the goal square. And and rely on to, to take a grab or at least put some pressure on it. We, we tend to still have to work the ball in there. Now, at the moment, we've got the fitness and 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 the leg speed to, to do that. But sometimes that just that fallback option of, you know, a, you know dare I say, a Tippett type or a Hawkins, even you know, Franklin, just that big body up there. So a Redden might have been handy too come finals time. Just a big bloke you can just go in long to. Yep. But, but other than that, I think... Um, they're just, it's just coming together. I think, I guess that's also what we have to appreciate that with this team, it's coming together. Again, you you sort of go back to where we were at the start of last year, what people thought of us. I think probably what the the club thought of itself, and how that confidence has grown and developed in in a very short space of time. You know, a, a full season and not even halfway through a second season, to where they are now and and where that trajectory will take them. It's it's a, it's scary, but it could scary. be a beautiful yeah. thing. What about the? Um, there was a couple of an, a couple of analogies um, post game that I've liked so far. Um, people aren't going to like one of my references, which was uh, from the Paul Alley Power Facebook page, where um, a picture was put up of Wingard uh, selling a Hawthorne player some candy, and so the Hawthorne players holding falling over, holding a big candy cane, and uh, and then someone followed up by um, calling Wingard the Candyman, which I thought was a fantastic name because I thought, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys talked about this, but uh, his performance uh, on the weekend was just sublime in the forward lines, um, Chad, and his candy selling ability was amazing. And then we had another poster 
Um, again, I apologise, I don't remember the names, um, but make the reference to Wingard and Polek sort of performing like the Harlem Globetrotters. And I reckon we, we're fortunate enough that you could almost put Robbie Gray into that category as well. I mean, Wingard, Polek, Gray, when it comes to flair and creativity, uh, there isn't much in front of them in relation to those traits. And, uh, and it's the nucleus of, a, of what's becoming a great side. That's right. I think um, I think Jakey Need had the Candyman mantle a few weeks back for a performance in his Sandville game, and I actually remember posting a a, um, a YouTube clip of Sammy Davis singing the Candyman um, after seeing that. So <laughs> he might he might have pipped Chad for that title, but that that was um, quite a, a brilliant piece of work there. I mean, he really should get gold of the round at least. Because it's not like he was. Oh, it's a fantastic. He was running around witches' hats. I mean, they were quality players that he just completely wrong-footed and then just casually slots a goal. But yeah. you're right. I think um, I think I saw a reference to to uh, maybe the '80s Lakers in Showtime. Someone, uh, one of our posters, mentioned that uh, in terms of the the sheer talent of some of these guys and what they can do with a footy. And as you say, Robbie Gray and and Pollock and Wingard, just amazing. I think if, if um, if Jakey Need gets a nod to come in for a bit of a run on um, Saturday in the uh, the Alice Springs game, you'll you'll have the whole the whole uh, Carney show going on there. Mm. All right, Rick, do you want to give us your best players, mate? Yeah, Travis Boak, fantastic captain, ten clearances, bountiful amount of contested possessions of disposals. You can't. You can't go wrong and go far past him, really, with all the experts. Um, I had Chad Wingard um, uh, second. I thought he was fantastic. Um, Jared Pollock third. His line-breaking ability is amazing, and I thought he had a great game. Yep. Um, I also had Brad Ebert up there. I mean, well, we talk about his workman-like ability, which sort of probably downplays his influence on the game, but... What a fantastic uh, Port Adelaide player and vice captain he is, and uh, I squeaked uh, my buddy uh, Jackson Trengove in for fifth fifth best on ground. I thought his utility type role he, when he dropped back into defence, he played fantastically well, uh, which isn't an easy job to do when you you know when you're not getting that consistency in, during a game, and then flipped into the ruck and was serviceable in the ruck, and it's just a shame he didn't take that specky. But yeah, that's my top five. Yep. Good stuff. And uh, Foot Falcon, your top five? Whew. Um, Bokey, I thought Boke was just fantastic. I thought he, he just worked so hard. I think he, he basically ran, just ran his his opponents into the ground. It was um, terrific. It's up and down the ground. Kicked that terrific goal as well. I, I just, I loved his game. I thought he was, he was um, just superb. And again, you know, we talked about his terrific leadership. Um... It's really hard to split them. I think, I think Chad Wingard, just sensational. He, he set the tone in the first quarter with those couple of goals. Probably not a not a heap of possessions, but just so dangerous up there and just completely unbalances defences now. And I think a couple of times where he's got that that basketball instinct where guys are trying to go over him or around him to to um, to switch the play or create something, and his ability to, to that vertical leap to read what they're going to do and to to knock the ball down. I think one time he just plucked the thing out of the air and ran off and kicked a goal. Yep. Um, I may have dreamt that, but <laughs> if something like that happened. Um, just just superb. Um, Ollie, Ollie Wines just you know simply because you, you underrate. When I say you, I mean uh, as the royal you. We all underrate. I think. His performances, or maybe not we all, I'm sure someone's going to post and say, I don't, but all right, maybe you don't. But I think he sets himself such a high benchmark, and he, he is amazing. Like, was he, eight, 19, 20 years old, and it's so such a power player that he just goes in there and he takes on guys, you know, up to 10 years older than him, years in the system, and, and just wills the ball away from them. I, I thought... His game was was just superb, just so strong, and usually really composed with the disability to, to pick a teammate out of out of traffic and and get it over to them. Just um, just superb. Homsch, I thought was was really good. Um, conceded a few goals, but as we discussed, a couple of those, you know, just 
superb kicks from outside 50 by Gunston. I mean, you know, credit yeah. where credit's due. Those those were just unstoppable. Um, one one where he slipped, um, that was a bit of bad luck. Another one where Gunston got on a good lead and kicked it from outside 50 and, and <laughs> drilled it through the middle with about 10 metres to spare. I mean, yeah. there, there comes a point where you go, OK, you, you basically going to have to give that one up. Um, and uh, a fifth best, Pollock, I mean, he probably... I probably um, undervalued his game a bit. Probably a few wasted disposals in the second half. Maybe just took the the edge off his his ranking for me a bit. But geez, he does some amazing stuff, some spectacular things. The goalie kick was was just um, jaw dropping when he took that handball out of centre, ran through, lined it up, popped it through the middle. Just the uh, just brilliant. And some of his work in his work in traffic. I think we were we were sold the. The story on him before he got there about how how much run he'd had as an outside player and his his work there is is superb but his 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 vision and his instinct and his movement in traffic and and even weaving through not just getting a ball out but weaving through and coming out with it, it's almost Franco esque. So yes, everyone's a winner, baby. That's the truth. Everyone except what for Pitt. Hey, <laughs> hey, 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 come on. <laughs> Stay on. Look, my top five, I had Jared Pollock best on ground. I think overall maybe Boak was better, but I just thought Pollock's run and vision, his creativity really set the scene early. Um, and he just tore Hawthorne to pieces with his with his, uh, with his his one-twos. And that fantastic goalie kick running out of the centre, yeah. I mean, that's just about the best goal we've seen all year, in my opinion. How many games has he played now? What, 20? In total? 20. Yeah, yeah he's 20, 21 or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's just absurd, isn't it? Mm, unbelievable. You couldn't it's... have hoped for a better recruit. No, no. he, you know, he. I know Dal Santos probably got better numbers at the moment, but come and see me in five years. That's right. Uh, Boki was my second best on ground. Just he went into beast mode on the weekend. He was absolutely unstoppable. Um, in a big game, he's a big game player. That's why he's our captain. 34 touches, uh, seven tackles, 10 clearances, seven inside 50s, and a goal. I mean, that's as good as it gets. Um, I had Robbie Gray as third. Not the uh, quantity of the ball that he's had in uh, previous weeks, but every time he got the ball, something fantastic happened. Just his ability to hang on to it for just the perfect amount of time, just to wait for a, a tiny little space to, to open up and deliver a handball or deliver a kick. It was fantastic. He kicked a couple of goals and had a couple of goal assists as well. Um, I snuck Ollie Wines in there late. Um, as we've said, it's just incredible that he's only, what, 19 or 20 years old in his second season. And he's just playing. I know everyone says it a lot, but he really is playing like a seasoned professional that's played 150 games. Just his smarts around the bowl, his ability to win the contested bowl. And his, uh, his uncontested side of his game is highly underrated, I think. Um, he was fantastic. And, uh, and Matty Lobie, uh, again, I thought he really set the scene in that first quarter. Got us going. I think we won 11 of 12 clearances um, during that first quarter. Um, and he was a major part of our win, I thought. Good call. Yep. I mean... <laughs> I think between the three of us, we could almost cover everyone on the ground. Mm. And we haven't really <laughs> even spoken about Monfries, who kicked four goals. You know, yeah. We haven't spoken about Harlot, yeah. who was very good. I mean, Brad Ebert was excellent. Kane Corns yeah. had a very, very good game on, on Hill, I thought, as well. Um, that was Broadbent's best game for a month. Alipati yep. Carlisle kept Hale goalless, I think. You know, just everybody did their bit. Bob Bob's been fantastic all year. I think he's he's gotten the the really big jobs week in week out. Kenny really trusts. He hasn't been him. beaten yet. No, he and has not no. been beaten, and, and he would and deserve really adding, to be in the All Australian team right now. He's he's adding rebound to his game as well. He's he's probably not David Dench like in uh, in Russell Eber Hamble's wild dreams, and probably not Roger Delaney like in mine as yet. But he's he's certainly adding that string to his bow. He's he's yep. getting, starting to stretch it a bit too. I think um, some of his his run running up right up the field is great, and he's such a big strong guy. He really powers. So I think Russell Jackson described him in the Guardian blog as um, you know the the man with the the 70s football thighs, and. <laughs> He, he certainly does fit that description, and yep. he really can power through players. That's right. Well, there you go, you little ripper. Cheer, cheer the
Alright, well on to the SANFL. Port Adelaide played North Adelaide at Prospect Oval. Uh, we won by 26 points. We won 12 goals 17 to 9 goals 9. We won all four quarters. Um, there was a couple of bad things that happened during the game. Um, as we've already spoken about in my love and hate, uh, we lost Campbell Heath and Brent Renouf in the, in the first 10 minutes um, with uh, stretcher cases with knee injuries. It looks like they're out for the whole year. Um, Another unsavoury thing was a North Adelaide supporter was reported by security for a, uh, a racial comment, um, which was uh, not very good at all. Um, Johnny Butcher kicked five goals and Mitch Harvey kicked two. They just keep rolling along, don't they? Like Old Man River. That's yeah. right. To win that game with uh, only one player on the bench uh, for yeah, but... pretty much the whole game yep. was a fantastic effort. Really and and a prospect testing. oval, it's, it's a difficult oval to play. It's, it's. Um, well, I guess we're lucky that we haven't had rain again until just now, but it can be quite a heavy ground to play on, yeah. and the angles on it are very difficult for visiting teams, and it's always been a difficult ground to play on for, for any visiting side. And they were certainly prepared for us, and I think had we kicked a bit straighter, we, we probably would have won that even more comfortably, but... I think, you, you know, you take a... It's funny, isn't it? You have nearly a five-goal win and you're sort of thinking you've got to make excuses. And it's uh, it certainly shouldn't be that case. I think we've, no. you've been, we've been treated to some uh, scintillating football from this, this Sample side now since that first round against Norwood. I mean, you know, we, we chopped up Glenelg like steaks at the butcher shop. I, went, I was at the Eagles game and just sort of basically we were 10 goals better than them all day. Yep. And every time I've seen them play, uh, we've, we've looked 10 goals better than whoever we've played. So you're sort of getting, you think, oh, we've only won by five goals. And we won by five goals at Prospect with one, one man on the bench for virtually four quarters, uh, yep. you know, having to makeshift the, the whole ruck rotation. And um, a lot of young kids in there. And, of course, you know, Daniel Flynn, the Irish recruit, who's, who's still learning the game. And it's a, it's a pretty good result. It was a very good effort. North... Played very, very well. They actually got within two goals uh, late in the final quarter, and then we kicked away again. Um, yeah. They put in a fantastic effort, but, you know, I thought the guts of our side to come out there with only one player on the bench for pretty much the whole game um, against a pretty good North Adelaide outfit was a, was a fantastic thing. Um, I thought uh, uh, Brueggemann's effort in the ruck after Renouf went down was absolutely outstanding. Even though he, he didn't win a lot of hit-outs, uh, just his his contests and his will to uh, succeed in those contests was fantastic. Isn't, um, isn't he a great player to watch, though? I he mean, is, you, he's you, just you, such you an old-school footballer. Yeah, you think 1970s football, you imagine him, you know, with a it's long like watching neck. Jeff Phelps again. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's better. I think he's actually better than Phelpsy, but... That's right. I thought Paul Stewart was probably best on ground. He had 29 touches and 10 marks. He really controlled that sort of half-forward... Uh, pushing up into the midfield zone. He was absolutely fantastic. Tommy Logan was just a tiny bit behind him. I thought he was excellent at, uh, at halfback. Uh, Sam Gray put in another fantastic effort. Benny Newton was consistent as always. So was Summerton. I didn't really notice Summerton a lot at the ground, but you know his statistics were fantastic as well. As always. As always, that's it. Yeah, Tommy Cleary did a fantastic job down back. Um, He's been really good this year, hasn't he? He has, he really yeah. I noticed that when he, he, he took... Red Eddie out of the South game just shut him right down and gave us a, a ton of rebound as well coming up out of half back because Eddie was pushing up the ground a lot trying to get kicks and Cleary yeah. just followed him up and, and just gave us a, a heap of rebound. I think he just keeps improving and you know he's he's got to be knocking on the door as well. <laughs> the door's yeah. getting a dense in it really. There's a few blokes knocking on it pretty hard. There is. And then there's Johnny Butcher. Johnny Butcher. The, Butch. the enigma in a riddle. Surrounded by a conundrum. Time to come in. You reckon it's time? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. That was He kicked five goals, but it, again, it just wasn't a very impressive yeah. performance. It's, it's really hard to rate Butch's game on the weekend because he kicked three goals pretty early on in the piece. All of them were from a metre out from Joe the Goose handballs over the top. Yeah. Fair enough he's getting in that position to uh, to receive those goals. That's that's fine. Uh he kicked five goals too, which on uh, on paper looks very, very good. But he also had probably three out on the fools and two, which uh, slid off the side of the boot and didn't make the distance. 
Um, he took six marks and a number of incredibly good uh, contested grabs, especially late in the game when we needed someone to stand up. He was arguably the match winner in the last quarter. I but think we need it. You just, I think... you just can't help but sort of face palm whenever he goes near the bowl because it's, it's either something incredibly good and then he does four things where you go, this is just awful. Well, it's structure time, though, I think. I think I think Westhoff's showing us that we need another tall up there. Um, we, he's definitely been down since we've lost that third tall up forward, Westhoff, that is, um, with his form. Uh, I really think we need another one in there, even if it's maybe Cleary uh, to the defensive half and swing Trengove forward as a centre-half forward. But mm. I do think we need we need another um, another tall presence up forward. Um, yeah, I'd be quite happy to see him go into the Port Adelaide side this week. Um, it would be good to see how we go again with those three key forwards up there. I think we need to take some pressure off Westhoff, who hasn't kicked a goal for, what, six weeks now or something. Um, I think it'd probably even take a bit of pressure off Schultze because oh, he's, yeah. As, yeah. He's, Definitely. He, he's really copping a lot of attention. He is. I feel and a bit sorry for Johnny Pitcher like... because he was... Like the North Adelaide crowd were absolutely relentless on mm. him on the weekend. They were giving the, him an incredible amount of shit. <laughs> and I actually mm. feel quite sorry for him. I actually think it probably affected his game because um, they started to arc up when he missed a goal in the first quarter. Um, and then from that point on, they were just relentless. Every time he went near the bowl, they were Bronx cheering him and giving him all sorts of abuse. And I think definitely through those middle two quarters, I think it, it possibly had an effect on his game. Um, but then, he, as I said, he was pretty much the match winner in the last 10 minutes, kicking two goals from uh, from pretty tough angles. What about um, Burn Jones? He was in the best players, Macca. Some a new a new name, uh, he, he creating some good. presence. Yeah, he was good. He what he didn't have a lot of the ball, um, but what he did was very very good. He provides a lot of run from half back, um, and I do like his ability to uh, to win the bowling contest as well. For someone that's pretty uh, pretty slender. Um, he doesn't mind throwing himself in and, and getting the hard ball. Mm. So what's he, he, he? I was going to say, he what's he showing us? Really he's showing us um, that I think he's got a bit of a future. To be honest, his yeah. uh, under 18s footage is really. I mean, you know, highlights packages are highlights packages. I know, but some really impressive stuff there from him. Really good footy brain. He's got a little bit of X factor about him. He's got pace. He's really courageous. He can shut an opponent down. And, and he can give great rebound. I think there's, a, there's really a lot to like there. And I think um, he could easily, over the next couple of years, become a fixture in that in our back line, coming off a half-back or even picking up, if a team has, say, two small forwards, and picking up the second small defender, if MP gets the first one. Oh, sorry, the second small forward, yeah. if he gets the first one. Um, you know, Mish was pretty keen on seeing him as a tagger, and I think he'd be pretty good in that role. I think he's very, very yeah. quick. He's uh, very, very fit. Um, he just needs to improve his uh, his mindset to be switched on 100% of the time. If he does that, he, he would be a very, very good tagger. And I think after, how, after the bye, we've got, we get to see Sam Russell. Yes. I'm oh, looking uh, forward to that. Of, yeah. uh, he's off of that really bad hamstring injury for you know, 10, 10, 12 weeks. And uh, they're saying that he'll, because the state game coming up this week and then Central's the week after, and he'll play against Central, so yep. I'm quite looking forward to seeing him. Um, again, really supposed to be really hard at it, tight defensively, strong body. Obviously, you know, he'd be way out of match conditioning, but um, you know, they, they, they thought enough of him that he could easily have been picked up in the national draft, and, and they snapped him up with their first pick in the rookie draft. Yep. Uh, suggests that he's obviously got a bit of ability, so yeah, Indeed. looking forward to seeing him play. Yep, absolutely. All right, well, I think we might leave it there for now. It's, uh, it's been a long one. It's been it a good has. one. We've, we've, we lost one of our, our co-hosts a couple of times. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's vanished. That's, that's uh, just a weekly norm. That's Twilight zoned his way out of here. <laughs> Clever editing, you'll never know what happened. No, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's it. Well, thanks, Ford, for coming back on, mate. Thank you for inviting me. And a great weekend to come on. Yeah, I picked a good one. Well, you picked a good one for me. It was a, a, a terrific, just a terrific set of results. You know, it's all around uh, the game, the crowd, the atmosphere, the whole, the whole box and dice was just Eddie Dingle more than you could ask for. And yes, Eddie Dingle. <laughs> yeah, 
Sorry, Eddie, I couldn't make it. Hopefully the uh, the next one uh, will finally meet. He'll give you a headlock and a kiss at the same time. It's, it's yep. fantastic. And a noogie. And a noogie, yep. Is he a, is he a big fellow, is he? <laughs> he's, he's six foot five and oh. built like a tank and uh, yeah. isn't shy. He's a legend. Good great, work. Great bloke. Rick, as always, buddy, it's been fantastic. Pleasure, mate. We'll see you on uh, Thursday night. That's it. Until next time, go Port Adelaide. Go Port Adelaide. Franco, the running Francis. It's deafening at Footy Park. It's like finals footy. Oh. Trent Ray marks at half board. He's lifted as well, Trent Ray. Five marks for him this afternoon. To the goal square. Chad Corns is the man of the moment. Can't do it this time. Stewie Jew. Right one.